Welcome to another episode of the Capital Playbook. My name is Charles Williams. I am the owner and managing member of Pioneer Realty Capital, and we're excited to bring to you a phenomenal episode, especially if you are looking to get into real estate development. We brought in some industry experts to help us out with the subject. Uh, we're going to talk about all things real estate from a construction uh, perspective. But before we get into our conversation today, there are a couple of housekeeping things we want to do. Number one, if you like this program, if you appreciate the quality of information that we're giving you, do us a favor and subscribe and like this episode. If you do that, we'll be forever grateful. But uh, use this as an opportunity to educate yourself and continue to support us. And that way we can bring you valuable information. With that being said, please welcome with me, um, Mr. Eric Gilbert and Mr. Dorico Lewis of Scott and Reed General Contractors. Welcome, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Well, thank you for being on our show. So, uh, as I mentioned, um, these gentlemen are experts when it comes to uh, real estate uh, construction development. Um, tell us a little bit about uh, uh, Scott and Reed and, and your backgrounds and how you guys came to uh, get into uh, uh, construction, general contracting, especially doing general contracting for commercial buildings. Right. Well, I'll start out real quick. Um, so when I graduated from uh, college in 96, I, you know, of course, didn't really know what I was going to do, but I just had heard that, hey, you got to get into commercial real estate. That's the ticket. That's the ticket. So I ended up starting on the transaction side, thought I was going to, I wanted to be a transit, big transaction guy, right? And so uh, learned real quickly through a couple of, one cycle being the dot com mm -hmm. that... Um, uh, you know, that might not be the best fit for me. I, uh, I my, you know, my parents said, go, go for it. hundred percent commissions, hundred percent commission. I don't know what to tell you if anything doesn't work out. So I had an opportunity to go work for a development company, which was, I thought at the time was going to be a real, a little safer landing pad for me. And it was, I learned a lot, did 10 plus years working for a really big development company. But through that process, I really enjoyed the, the construction side of it. I really enjoyed the, the horizontal and vertical aspects of that. And uh, you know, several, 10 years, 15 years, 12 years ago, I needed to, I wanted to make a change. I needed to get uh, out from underneath where I was, else I would have been stuck. And I really, I had a relationship with Brad and Chris, Brad Reed and Chris Scott, and we'd always talked about working together at some capacity, and the timing just was right at that moment. And I'd had the knowledge base, and I was going to say, hey, I'm going to bring in a different look, and I'm bringing in what we're talking about today is the developer look. So as I'm working with these teams, I'm looking at them saying, you need to think about it this way, or this is the emotion of what these guys are going through. So I feel like the construction side was a very good fit for me mm -hmm. because I can now work with Dorico and the teams and, and just kind of wear that developer's hat and kind of helps shepherd through the process. Mm -hmm. So it, you know, I have a lot of friends who are like, you should have done this your entire career. And I said, I wouldn't be any as very effective uh, with this. And had you I, not had the, right. the part before. Right. Now, when you were on the transaction side before, was that, were you uh, finding capital or were you, uh, what, what? I was handling of, leases. I started out, I started out, I was trying to get a job, trying to get a job. It was 1996 mm -hmm. and I ended up getting a job with uh, Grubb and Ellis. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you remember them or yeah. not. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, they said, yeah, we come on over, be a land industrial broker. And mm -hmm. I said, here we go. And I got there and they gave me a telephone and a workstation and said, start, start smiling and dialing. There you go. And, you know, I was just doing some industrial and land transactions. And then next thing you know, uh, you know, I, I, at that point, I thought I was rich. I had a lawn chair and a TV. Mm -hmm. I was living in an apartment. And, oh, uh, <laughs> hey, life was good. And then, uh, and then the world unraveled. And, uh, you know, hey, you start reinventing yourself again. There you go. What about you, Dorico? How, how, uh, how did this commercial real estate path start out for you? It started out for me, you know, at a young age. So mm. I grew up in a small town in Mississippi mm. and seeing how um, there was really no development in mm. my neck of the woods um, gave me the interest to want to figure out, OK, how can I learn a little bit more about what drives the future, what drives the industry when mm. it comes to real estate buildings in general? Mm. So I started my career out in school. You know, initially I thought that, OK, let me go to school. Let me figure it out exactly what it is that I want to do. Initially, when I got to school, because I thought I thought about 
biology, right? Mm -hmm. The initial goal was to be a physical therapist. And mm -hmm. I quickly learned, like, nah, that ain't really what I want to do. Mm -hmm. So I fell back on my initial thoughts of, okay, how would I be able to leave an impact and, and build something that will be here probably forever, mm -hmm. you know? So my journey started Southern Miss, um, went, into the, went into Southern Miss mm -hmm. into architecture engineering, mm -hmm. um, graduated with a minor in construction management and graduated there um, fall of 99. Okay. I left there and I went to work for a MEP architectural firm. So mm -hmm. I like to say that I got the best of both worlds. Mm -hmm. So went to Northwest Arkansas, ended up going to the Walmart capital of the world. That's mm -hmm. their hometown. Mm -hmm. So the firm that I work for, we did a lot of Walmart. So it was a great experience for me because I got to travel. Mm -hmm. I got to see a lot of different types of building types on the Walmart side of things. Mm -hmm. So when working in an architecture firm, as my career started to progress, I got into uh the administrative side of going out to the sites, looking at the projects, trying to figure out, are they built to our plans and specifications? Mm -hmm. So con construction administration. And while doing that a few years, I was like, man, this is this is where I want to be at, mm -hmm. you know? Tired of being tied behind the desk, you know, yeah. we, we take the drawings, we create the drawings. And mm -hmm. so now I thought, okay, now I can physically go out in the field and see everything that I've put on paper, mm -hmm. how it comes together in the field. So I think it was like 2003, 2004, I reached out to a buddy of mine, a colleague of mine that I went to school with and say, hey, you know, are you guys hiring on the commercial side of things, GC side of things? He's like, yeah, send me your resume. Mm -hmm. And, you know, long story short, mm -hmm. that's how I eventually transitioned over into the construction side of things. Okay, very good. So so both of you guys have been um, in this for over 20 years, right. um, you know, uh, working from various aspects, one coming from the transaction side, handling leases into construction and one coming from that engineering architecture background uh, coming into construction, which is a very unique balance of uh, expertise and experience. Um, now, when you're working with um, individuals that come to you, for instance, uh, I come to you, I'm a real estate developer, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I have this grandiose vision uh, of something I'm going to develop. Maybe it's this a perfect hotel that I'm going to put on this really beautiful piece of land that's overlooking the lake, right? Um, as you're going through that, when that, um, first of all, when, if you were a king for a day, would you like for that developer to start talking to you about his prospective development project? Uh, should it be when he gets ready to take this thing out to bid? Uh, or, or is there, um, it, are there areas where you can help them prior to that? Yeah, I, I think just from experience, you know, that that raw piece of land, I think that when that vision comes that mm -hmm. you want to develop that piece of land, mm -hmm. I think you need to be talking with a general contractor at that point mm -hmm. because there's going to be some things that we can kind of shed some light on and guide you through that you may not may or may not know of at the time when you right. were, when you're looking at that piece of land, right? So I think to answer that question, yes, that needs to happen when that decision is made to – start development on any piece of land mm. is to come on board, get a, get a reputable builder at that point to come on board to just mm. try to answer some of the questions that that developer may or may not know about at that time mm -hmm. for and that particular then, lot. And then usually, uh, you know, that beautiful piece of land you're talking about, mm -hmm. and of course I'm, I'm congratulating you and I think it's great. My first question is, what's the setback off the, off the water? Who controls the water? Mm. Because uh, here we go, because, you, you know, it, it might be this beautiful piece of land and mm -hmm. you might not really be able to do what you want to do with it mm -hmm. uh, right off the get. So, um, but no, I mean, I, I agree with the Rico where, you know, the earlier you engage, uh, the earlier you pick up the phone and talk to uh, somebody that you know that you work with in, in, in general contracting mm -hmm. and even maybe even architecture as well. So, hey, this is what I'm thinking about doing. You don't want to get to a point where you have a gun to your head because your money's about to go hard and you're trying to figure out if you mm. can really do this or not. Yeah. So, so you know, know and these are important things. Um, uh, there are two uh, words that are used in the uh, pre-development process. Uh, one is uh, horizontal infrastructure. Uh, the other is vertical, uh, the vertical portion. Um, how important would you say it is to really understand the horizontal part and how can a good, capable general contractor coming in early on really help you understand it? I'll take the horizontal side. Just from a from a development aspect, mm -hmm. 
um, that's the one piece of the. It's the most important part of the of the project. It's the heart of the watermelon, right? But it's mm-hmm. there's nothing aesthetically pleasing about it, right? Mm-hmm. You don't. There's nothing pretty about horizontal development. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's why it can always be kind of an afterthought or we'll, we'll, we'll worry about that. I mean, you got, we got storm sewer, you got a little drainage, maybe, you know, some electrical, no big deal. Mm. Um, it can completely shatter your dream. Mm. Uh, if you, uh, don't pay attention to horizontal first, cause you know, nothing mm. permanent is built on faulty framework. Mm. And so if, uh, you know, I think the one the one thing that we do a very good job of is we are very transparent mm. uh, from the horizontal standpoint, and we are you know very open book and say this is what it is, mm. this is where your dollars are going first. Everything else means nothing if this isn't done. So, mm. uh, you know, once you've got that in place, then the vertical uh, will all take care of itself. Mm. Um, did you have anything to add to that? Yeah, and I'd just like to say to kind of reiterate what Eric is saying, you know, when it comes to that horizontal construction, like we say, I mean, when you're looking at a site and you having to, to figure out what the cut and fill ratio is going to be, is, mm. it a, is it a cut site? Is it a fill site? Is mm. it a balance site? Like all of those parameters have an impact on the end result and the end cost of what it's going to cost. So, yes, you know, where, where's the nearest, you know, water tap going to be mm-hmm. coming from, you know, um, how deep do we have to go to get to those utilities, you know, before we can bring them to the site. So mm-hmm. they're, they're, like I say, that horizontal side of the table, I mm-hmm. think, like we say, a lot of people may or may not understand what's truly involved in that and kind of take it for granted. But that's that can be a major cost impact to mm-hmm. any development that you have going. And I think the other thing is, is what the RICO pressed upon too, is, is understanding the municipal, municipalities too, you know, mm-hmm. who is doing what and who's controlling what, mm-hmm. um, very important. Yeah. And so, um, you know, I also think of things like, um, you know, your, uh, your wastewater, mm-hmm. uh, your lift station, you know, uh, how are you going to size it? Um, is the city, are there resources, enough to handle the sewage that you're going to be depositing into their system, you know. Now, um, and, and these are the things that you really help your developers understand early on in the process. Now, but I guess my question is, I can see the value as a developer, mm-hmm. um, but that's a lot of work. There's a lot of evaluation. There's a lot of analysis that goes into that. And, of course, there are third-party reports that we rely right. on. Right. But how does that impact you from a cost basis, uh, when when if you have a relationship with a developer and he's bringing you on early on to look at deals, um, you know, does that present additional cost to you? Absolutely, it does. So to just go back, you know, what you just said about a lift station, right? So mm-hmm. let's just take, you may be, let's just say if we're talking about an, a rural area like Oak Point, mm-hmm. uh, Melissa, one of those municipalities that are out there, you know, if you're in a mud district, for the most part, as a developer, mm-hmm. a lot of that is going to get pushed back on you, right? Mm-hmm. So if I got to put in a lift station, mm-hmm. that means I got to have the backup power to run that lift station. Mm-hmm. If my force main is is across the street, that means I got to bore under that street to get to that main. So right. again, a lot of that is adding cost to the job mm-hmm. versus having a site where your tap is already nearby, where you don't have to spend those extra dollars mm-hmm. that goes into making sure that you got your infrastructure to support all of your utilities coming to the site. Mm-hmm. So now, are are you guys um, helping? Let's say, for instance, I'm going to develop in Melissa or some uh, secondary tertiary market, and uh, I don't really know the market very well. I, I may have a geotech study, but I don't understand site utilities. Um, uh, it it would make sense for me to engage you guys, absolutely, absolutely. and you know, but but how do you pay for that? Uh, because if I'm spending your time and your resources and your money um, to um, bring you into a project early on, um, you know, is it to is it the hopes of being able to get the job? Oh uh, yeah, at the end the end of the game is the so you know you got. <clears throat> We're in the people business first, <laughs> and you know, I, let's say we're in the service business. It, it's it's a yeah. Look, it's a relationship, right? right? And 
we, we have those are the things that we have to do. That's the services that we have to provide for the opportunity. To, 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 well, yeah, and a lot of the guys, a lot of the groups that we work with, we've have that built in relationship. Yeah. So when we're sitting across the table with them, we're already talking. We're talking early mm -hmm. <clears throat> if it's a tertiary market or wherever it may be, and we're we're discussing things with mm -hmm. them. Um, but then again, you know. Where we're most successful is we, we create opportunity for those that don't have a way, mm -hmm. okay? And and if we just shut down and say, no, we're not going to do this unless you uh, you, know, you sign this contract or this pre-construction agreement, mm -hmm. then then we would never – we wouldn't be where we're at. Yeah. And so we're trying to build some trust and some insight. And with things – you know, not every deal makes, right? Mm -hmm. And then you kind of said there's, there's a, but you know what? We also walk away with that knowledge base mm -hmm. of saying, now it's expensive knowledge base. Mm -hmm. It can be, but we walk away going, okay, they come back to the table. We got everything set. Or if somebody comes through the door and says, I want to do the same thing. We can say, hey, listen, we just did this down the road and here's what, here's what you need to think about. Mm -hmm. And right. so, yeah. And like you say, with us being in the service industry and the industry that we're in, we, we, we understand that you can't hand everybody a fee just to talk to them right. Right, at the end of the day, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're here to, you know, hear out the client, hear what the aspirations and the dreams are for mm -hmm. whatever development is trying to happen. Mm -hmm. And we're going to help navigate you through that, right? Mm -hmm. Of course, we, we all don't work for free at the end of the day, right. but there there is a point where if you come to me and you say, hey, I'm looking at this piece of land, you know, can you give me some insight? Can you run me some, some preliminary numbers to, mm -hmm. to give me an idea of what this looks like? Mm -hmm. No problem whatsoever. But, you know, as we can continue to drive and develop what's going on with your project, then we may say, okay, you know, let's talk a little bit in depth about how do we come to the table to really engage and, and mm. getting deeply involved in this project. Right. right. You know, demonstration of goodwill. But, but, but yeah. one, one, one other thing about that too is, is we like to set the expectation yeah. to the developer. Well, you know, what you give us is what you're going to get back. Yeah. Right. And so the more information you have, the more involved you are, yeah. uh, you know, the, 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 you know, the better we can provide the information back to them. You know, I, I get phone calls all the time and I was like, do you want per square foot number? You know, do you want it horizontal? Do you want it vertical? What do you want? I can give it to you real quick because, yeah. you know, I can look at some historicals. I can tell you what we're doing. You know, tell me what, what exactly you want. Yeah. And then if it's a little bit more than that, we'll go, we'll huddle up and talk and call you back and say, mm -hmm. hey, we need X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a lot of different ways. And sometimes I'll look at Dorico and say, hey, I need the, you know, you know John needs this. And he kind of looks at me. I was like, now don't burn a lot of calories on it. He right. just needs to get going, you right. know. Unfortunately, I'm the yes guy. You know, I, hey, we're going to make every deal, right? And the Rico just rolls his eyes at me, but uh, and you know, he gets into the he gets into the weeds that put me to sleep. So you know, it's it, but it's again, it's how we how we present the information. Right, right. So now uh, I know that a lot of uh, the value that you guys bring uh, early on into the process. Uh, can ultimately result in savings right. uh, for that developer. For instance, if you're helping me understand key things about uh, my horizontal, uh, that that's it, prior to me buying the land, uh, that's a service that my my civil engineer m may be providing. But if I know up front, you know, uh, and, and especially if I know and it and then I know it's not going to work then that prevents me from hiring that civil engineer Absolutely. too early. Uh, so I can see the value in that. Um, now, it's very interesting because I've been talking, obviously, with a lot of uh, general contractors, and I am personally starting to see a shift in the way that uh, general contractors are uh, becoming part of projects. And what I mean by that is in my career, as you guys know, I started out, you know, in the contracting field myself. Um, you know, you get your set of plans and specs and, you know, we used to have a plan room. Do they still have plan rooms? They're probably online now, right? Yeah. Y'all yeah, probably don't go. <laughs> right. And, and then, you know, you throw it out there, there's blood and water, everybody goes and they give you a bid and, and you get a price. And, and then, of course, the strategy used to be, you know, you low bid, 
on bid day, and then you change your order that sucker to death, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, and then you know, everybody's broke at the end, right, <laughs> and mad. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> right. So uh, do you see that landscape changing right now? And if so, uh, how do you see it changing? Uh, I think what's happening, like you say, is that um, you you have – you have developers, mm -hmm. you have investors that are on board as well. Mm -hmm. The developers come up with a performer that's been sold to the investors and everybody's getting involved. Mm -hmm. When you start the bid process on what's going on, it's kind of like, okay, did you take in consideration of X, Y, Z during that initial phase of the performer phase before you brought in the investors? Mm -hmm. what, we, what we tend to see now is that I, I think what's what's driving the market and what's I've seen this trend just happening over the years is that now there's more responsibility being put on the contractor mm -hmm. from a standpoint because I think the AE team is not given the ample time to put the docs together mm -hmm. that they needed because, like you say, these deals are deals. And mm -hmm. from a developer standpoint, you're looking at how quickly can I turn it to get the tenants in and start, mm -hmm. you know, generating cash flow at the end of the day. So a lot of the responsibilities that used to um, hang with the AE team mm -hmm. now gets shifted to us. Mm -hmm. And so when we start accepting those new principles that are coming in, now when we start to look at our subcontractor party as well, the low bid is not necessarily the best the value. Bid, right. right? right. So mm -hmm. we like to analyze it from a standpoint. We take every project and we look at it. What is it that we're trying to deliver, you know, mm -hmm. at the end of the day? What the market is telling us is our ABC guys, are they all tied up on the bigger project? Mm -hmm. You know, who can we tap to come in that we truly trust that would deliver the the standards that mm -hmm. Scott and Reed stand behind? Mm -hmm. So we, we take all of that in consideration before we send that number out the door, mm -hmm. you know, when we look at it from a grand scheme mm -hmm. of things. And I, I think it makes sense and it's, it's really important. Um, and I'll just tell you my experience. Um, you know, when I, I used to be a temperature controls contractor, and so, you know, those uh, plan and specs are going to come from your MEP engineer, mm -hmm. right? So, well, who who do you think gave the MEP engineer the plans and the specs? You did. Yeah, and so <laughs> it, it's crazy because we were designing our own project because we were the experts yeah, in, in doing it. So it only makes sense now, and, I, and I'm starting to see this shift, where, and I'm glad I'm seeing this shift, and it's a protection for developers to where general contractors are engaging early, not only with the owners, but also with the design team, uh, so that you don't have to do all this value engineering on the backside. You hope not. You know, I think the, the, the fabric of our business, too, is is we're business people, you mm -hmm. know, we've come a long way, you know, I mean, when you think general contractor, you, right. what, what, what people used to think, what we're really doing is, is we're, we're mitigating risk for mm -hmm. the developer. Okay. So when we're, when we're talking early on in, in the new world that we live in, we're underwriting that. Okay. How much of this, we're going to take this risk off your plate. Okay. Mm -hmm. And now with all this risk I've taken, and I'm very comfortable with it. I've, I'm going to go to my partners, my subs that I know can handle this, okay? Mm -hmm. And I'm going to start offloading some of that, okay? I'm ultimately responsible, and I'm a steward of your dollars, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, of course, we laugh and giggle about change orders and the way it was back in the day. Mm -hmm. But yeah, no, nothing good comes from change orders. Right. A general contractor doesn't make any more money with a change order. It actually messes up the schedule mm -hmm. and messes up the balance of the deal. Mm -hmm. So... Now, today, where we're at in general contracting is that there is a level, and I'm going to use a word that we probably would not necessarily use in general contracting, of sophistication. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it is a commodities business. Mm -hmm. And so the things that we're looking at is obviously on a daily basis is the commodities markets. Mm -hmm. And we're looking at the labor markets mm -hmm. and we're watching the debt and equity markets mm -hmm. because all of that greatly impacts just us being a general contractor. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a different world out there now. Yeah, and I, I agree with that word because I think in order to survive at, at the level um, where we are now in terms of development and real estate, uh, general contractors and subcontractors have to be more sophisticated. Uh, they have to be more business people. You can chase jobs or you can chase clients. Yeah. We choose to chase clients. Mm -hmm. 
uh, you know, jobs are what you, we were talking about. It's just mm-hmm. competitive bid, low bid. Hey, let's get this done in and out. And that's it. We're in the process or what we do for the last 30 years and what we're going to continue to do in the future is chase clients. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so 30 years is a long time in business. Um, most general contractors don't make it five years, 10 years, 15 years, and very few make it to 30 years. What would you say is your secret? They didn't buy cigarette boats, lake houses. No, I mean, they, <laughs> you know, uh, I, th- I think that, well, again, being privately held mm-hmm. uh, allowed us to be business people, mm-hmm. allowed us to be partners. Uh, our ownership has always reinvested back in the company. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have watched our competitors and our friends do exactly what you said, the, the great implosion, right? And then have to come back and reinvent themselves. So we keep our, our cash reserves up for mm-hmm. times like this. Mm-hmm. We also, uh, and so it's we're very intentional in making sure that there's the money is going back into the company, mm-hmm. Obviously, we're taking care of our employment base, but we're really, you know, you know focusing further down the road. Mm-hmm. We know that you have to have that working capital. Mm-hmm. Well, that that's that's definitely key. Um, so now you're engaging with your clients on a relationship basis early on. Uh, you have your book of clients. Um, are you? You know, what, what would you say you you are on your book? Are you growing your book of clients? Um, or are you pretty satisfied with who you're working with? Where, where do you guys stand? I don't think you're ever really satisfied, mm-hmm. especially in the service business. But you also need to be careful uh, on the amount of work you take right. take on. You need to make sure it's in your core competency. Mm-hmm. Uh, you also want to make sure that, uh, you know, you're always selling yourself, but you need to make sure that you're you're getting into a deal with somebody that that, that makes sense to us too. Mm-hmm. I mean, that we all share the same vision and core values, right? right. And so, um, you're always looking for. I'm always looking for new opportunity. I you know, I'm not going to sit around and say, "Well, we've got exactly the market share we want," but I think we're in a good position with the market share that we have. Uh, is is to seek out. Um, appropriate clients Mm -hmm. and I think that's what we're doing right now I think we've been very successful with that Mm -hmm. I think that once once somebody like Dorico or another senior project manager takes over that the the runway is wide open Mm -hmm. they do a very good job of the service side so and I like to think of it too is um, some of the best projects are some of the ones that you didn't take on you know at the end of the day you know we look at it from uh, more of a stair step trajectory mm. than to just take off like a rocket. So mm. we don't want to be in a position where we're under delivering to the client right. at the end of the day by taking on more work or capacity mm. that we can truly handle just to just to say that yes. Book the job. Right. right. Or right. yes. And be a yes man, you mm. know, to every client that comes through the door. So mm. no, you know, we're not afraid to say no, we, we can't take on this capacity because we take each job that we do to a level that we want everybody full attention to that job to deliver mm-hmm. that project on time or within budget. So mm-hmm. everything is calculated on the work that we take in. So it's a slow growth. We're looking to grow, but at the same time, it's, it's calculated. Mm-hmm. So uh, Eric, you had mentioned that um, you look for the right client. Right. If you were to give a profile of what that right client is, uh, what would be some of the key characteristics that client would have? Well, I would first of First of all, uh, I want to understand uh, from a from just a community standpoint, who is this? But what's their reputation in the business, right? Uh, how long they been? How long have they been in the business? And, the, and again, reputation is very important. Oh, yeah. And integrity. Uh, you know, does this person pay their bills? Mm-hmm. First and foremost. Um, you know, as as far as just having a this is in a perfect world. What is that client? Everybody's different, yeah. right? And and every deal is different. Um, I really do feel like the most important thing to me is is integrity and reputation. Yeah. And it, you don't have to be in the business twenty five years and say this guy checks out. Uh, you know, a lot of it. You know, we're blessed to know a lot of people and do life with a lot of people in this town, probably as you are. Yeah. So you kind of know. And uh, you know, my whole thing is is I don't want to put my my team, my guys, my partner in a position where 
he doesn't fail because he doesn't deliver. Yeah. We fail because I brought the wrong person to yeah. the table. I'm not going to put the blinders on and say, well, we're going to make this work. Right. Um, it's, but, you know, of course, um, you want to be objective. You want to be fair. Mm. Uh, but, you know, every client's different. Okay, well, very good. Yep. And Eric kind of talked a little bit, kind of on the, mm -hmm. the internal partner side, but we like to, you know, our subcontractors is a is the lifeline of what we do. Right. And so, with the subcon subcontractor base that we have, mm -hmm. you know, that payment on time becomes real critical to mm -hmm. them, right? So, they know that we're a reputable company. That if if they're engaged with us, we're going to pay on time. Mm -hmm. And so, what that means for them is now they cash flow can go in and you know multiple different directions because mm -hmm. it's not tied up just waiting on payments from you know right. one GC. And so that's predictable that, cash flow. Right? Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. So they they are the lifeline of our business and what we do, and we're very selective of those partners that we bring on mm -hmm. from the subcontractor world. Yeah, and it is important to understand as a general contractor, you're really organizing um, various trades uh, to get an end result. You're, you're that um, that expert that knows what are, who are the right trades, who's doing quality work, mm -hmm. and you're bringing that uh, to, the, to the party for the developer. What do you do to qualify, uh, retain, and train those uh, contractors, those uh, subcontractors? So what we do from, from that aspect of it is – if you if, like, you would understand Ben that you came from JCI, so you're your controls mm -hmm. type guy, right? Mm -hmm. So when we look at our MEP partners, you know, mechanical, electrical, plumbing partners, mm -hmm. when you look at a project, that is the lifeline of the project. Your mm -hmm. MEP systems and the uh, structure itself, right? Yep. So when you look at those components and you start to reach out to those guys. From the MEP side of things, we, we know that they're in continual training. Mm -hmm. We house training within our offices to get those guys in to, you know, go over some of the components with the younger generation that mm -hmm. are coming up, right? They are the subject matter experts. We rely on them and they rely on us, you know, mm -hmm. from a standpoint, okay, well, how much space are we going to have above the ceiling if we got a plan to work out of? Mm -hmm. You know, what type of system is going to develop the best performance given the parameters that we have? So mm -hmm. all of those conversations is what we bounce off of our subcontractors, you mm -hmm. know, doing any project that we undertake. Mm -hmm. You know, kind of like we spoke earlier, the times are changing. You know, you may have a developer that comes in and he got a back a back of napkin sketch, right? Mm -hmm. I, I want this building. And I may have a performance of if I'm talking tilt wall, I want, you know, 28, 30 feet, you know, clear space up above. Right. Mm -hmm. So we we can take that information and work with our sub partners to, to determine what's going to be the best system to mm -hmm. actually heat and cool this this type of facility. Mm -hmm. And and so so your relationships uh, work both ways, the relationship with the developer, which is important for the for the developer. And your relationship with the subs, yes. because now you have this army of subject matter experts uh, that aren't just people that show up on bid day. Correct. These are people that you have deep relationships with and they can advise you so that you can properly serve your client. Right. right. And, and then, like you say, having that tight knit, you know, with a handful of good subcontractors kind of gives you an, a competitive advantage as well, mm -hmm. you know, to your competitors who may be bidding against you, right? Mm -hmm. So we can propose different things just because we've brainstormed, we've, we're talking, we're communicating mm -hmm. to figure out what is going to be the best method to deliver this project when mm -hmm. it comes to these types of systems, whereas a lot of times people just look at what's on the prints and the, and the plans because everybody is busy and nobody's just taking the time to really just dive into and try to figure out what's Look working. At it from a systems approach Absolutely. as opposed to just building. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I tell you, I, I love that because, you know, uh, I, <laughs> I can tell you stories. You know, we've gone in, we built stuff, and it was according to plans and spec. Then I turn around and spend a million dollars fixing what we built, yeah, right. you know, or making what we built work. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so, so having those key partners are very important. Well, let me ask you this. Uh, if you had three words of advice uh, that you would give to a prospective developer who's, who's looking to find a quality general contractor as a partner, uh, what, what would those three things or three words be? I would say first, have a, do business with a contractor that is known for the area that you're going to be building in. Okay. They're going to know the ins and outs of those municipalities to tell mm -hmm. you one way or the other, hey, this is what we've experienced because we've done, you know, 
multiple, multiple projects in mm -hmm. this vicinity of this ASJ is one. The constructability side of it is the is the is the other side of it, right? If I'm if I'm on a site again and I I've done a little bit of research just seeing what project has been built around there, right? So I know whether it's a block over or, you know, the next lot over, this project we had peers that went down to, let's just say, 20 feet. Mm -hmm. A lot of times when you're looking at this plot of land, you may not know that, hey, to stabilize this building, I got a moisture condition down 12, 13 feet and bring it back up. Or if I got rock that's below, that's, you know, three foot, two foot below. So just knowing the area that you're building in and then that, general contractor, what relations they have in those counties and those municipalities mm -hmm. is going to prove big, a, a huge benefit going down the road for what you're trying to do. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Um, from my side of the table, I'd say get your debt and equity in order. Get that yeah. stack together. Before, call you. before you come. <laughs> well, not necessarily. Yeah, <laughs> right. but, but, but even then, don't right. get too far into something. Right. And, 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 you know, I mean, obviously we're in a different world right now, but, you yeah. know, there's a time when debt was so cheap, you know, and then all of a sudden, like, this is, you know, you go down the road with somebody like, well, all I got to do is now get my equity together. You're like, hang on a second. Right. You know, what do you mean get right. your equity together? Right. So, uh, yeah, get your debt and equity together first. Uh, that That's key. Mm -hmm. um, I agree with Dorico. Engage with somebody that has a knowledge base in mm -hmm. that market. Um, and then third, going back wearing the developer's hat, it Embrace and lean into the information that's given to you. Okay, don't. What I mean by that is don't manipulate your performa because you have fallen in love with that piece of property that backs up to the lake that you're going to build the multifamily and the hotel and this, that, and the other, and and just keep shaking your head because uh, you're going to make it work on paper because ultimately it's, it's going to cost what it costs. Yes. And I really appreciate something you said and alluded to. Um, and if you want to expound on it, you can, but I think it's important to understand that it's a commodities business. Right. You know, you're subject to the things that commodity industries right. and businesses are subject to. In this case, we're, you know, we have a labor market, uh, we have supply chain right. issues, mm -hmm. uh, all of those things, they cost what they cost, right? right? So, I mean, just real quickly, and I think things are going to get better, and things are going to get better, un unfortunately, because... Uh, the the debt markets where Shut it's at, down. So and so shutting down. That, that yes, but most importantly, well, you got to remember twofold: um, single family, new new build, single family track. You know, three hundred plus homes is slowing, right? Mm -hmm. So all of that commodity now is getting moved to us on the commercial side. Thank okay, God. yes, thank you. <laughs> Which is going to is going to drive our price down. Now I say that with everybody thinking, well, great. Well, we're going to go back to where it was. It's just like gasoline mm -hmm. back in the day. One day it was eighty five cents, then it jumped to one twenty five. And I remember looking, going, "Gosh, I can't wait for it to get back to eighty five cents." I said, "We'll never get back to eighty five mm -hmm. cents," and it never did. But they just hit that reset. But it's going to get uh, back to a palatable level mm -hmm. uh, from a commodity standpoint because there's going to be a lot of we're going to we're going to have a catch up here pretty mm -hmm. soon. Um, but you know, on the flip side to that is. Um, I feel like, and I might be getting out of my, my comfort zone with this, that this market slowdown is going to be more state by state. Yeah. I think that North Texas, the region, is in still going to be a steady mule and a pretty good spot to be in. If you think it could be a little bad here, think about what's going on in our neighbors of the West yeah. and the East, and they're going to come a-running. Yeah. So we're still going to have some opportunities. The challenge is going to be on your side of the table is it's going to be hard to get a development deal out of the ground right now with where the debt and equity markets are. Yeah. And so we now are impacted. I always say, you know, I don't have a job unless you have the gumption enough to make the cold call, right? Mm -hmm. So you're, you're a very important client to us. I always say it to those right. guys. The broker, the developer, he's the one that's created this opportunity. Mm -hmm. So we've got to make sure that we are servicing that person. Mm -hmm. And so I, I really think that in the next, you know, 18 to 24 months, I, I mean, we have a saying, you know, stay alive to 25. Yeah, right. But I think, you know, we're going to be okay. 
I think 26, get ready because I think you're going to start. We're going to start. We're going to start running again. Yeah, demand, demand is still yeah. high. Right. You know, we may have uh, issues with, you know, the financial markets right now. Um, incidentally, there is a lot of equity coming back. Right. It's, it's just, just sitting, sitting on the sideline. Well, who did I read about? Who's putting that fund? Is it Blackstone that's mm -hmm. putting that that multi-billion dollar fund together. I mean, they're getting ready. Yeah, yeah. So there's going to be a little bit of blood in the water here pretty soon. Well, Scott and Reed, Mr. Eric Gilbert, and Mr. Dorico Lewis, we're so happy that you guys took some time to come to our show today. Uh, great information, especially on the pre-development side. And it's really interesting uh, because we've talked to a number of general contractors to see this evolution of the relationship between the developer and the general contractor. And and I love the fact uh, of seeing this, uh, I, I, I hate, I don't want this to sound bad, but to see this level of professionalism uh, where you have general contractors now looking at performance uh, and really helping that developer make the thing work financially. So, so great conversation. Thank you for being here. Love to have you guys back uh, as, as a cycle, this current uh, economic cycle as we go through it, as it changes. Love to get your comments and thoughts on that in the future. But thank you for coming. Absolutely. Today. Thank sir, you for having us. Sir, I just awesome. want to end by just saying, you know, greatly appreciate it. And, you know, to everybody out there that's looking to do this, there are opportunities out there. You know, follow your dream and just always remember, even in these markets, in any market, cash is king, but relationships is everything. Thank so just, just food for thought. Just think about that. Love that, love that. Any closing words with you? Just keep swinging, and when that bat gets heavy, get a lighter bat. There you go. <laughs> I love it. Well, guys, thank you so much for being a part of our show, and thank you for being a part of our show, and a double thank you for making sure you like and subscribe. Until next time, Charles Williams, Pioneer Realty Capital. We look forward to seeing you again as we talk all things real estate here on the Capital Playbook.